Hey, Diana, how are you? Hello, I'm okay. How are you? Yeah, great. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thanks so much for making the time to do this sentientist conversation with me. It's great to get the chance to, this is as close to in real life as we'll get for the moment. So, Yeah, for a while. (laughs) And it's a special honor to have you on as well, partly because you have the at sentientist Twitter handle, of course, which I um, have the at sentientism one, so they're a pair in a way, but also partly because you're one of the key inspirations for this amateur project of mine to raise awareness about the idea of sentientism. And this, obviously, this YouTube series and podcast series forms part of trying to normalize that way of thinking. And I guess the context for these conversations is really trying to focus on those two deep philosophical questions, what's real and what matters. And I guess my attempt at interpreting sentientism answers those by saying when it comes to what's real, we should use a naturalistic approach that uses evidence and reason to form hopefully provisional, probabilistic and prudent beliefs in an open-minded, high humility way. But when it comes to what matters, the clue is in the name that we should focus on sentience, the capacity for subjective experience. And there's no real reason to exclude any being that is capable of suffering or flourishing in that context. So it aims to set a very simple pluralistic baseline, and that leaves much for people to fight over at the same time. But in that context, I'm talking to people who agree with sentientism don't and have different interpretations of it as well. So it'll be fascinating to see where the conversation goes. So before we get started, for people who aren't aware of your focus and work, how would you best introduce yourself? My name is Diana Fleischmann and I'm an evolutionary psychologist. I had a job in the UK for a while, but I've quit that job. Now I write and do other projects. And I also started off thinking about sentientism not that long ago, maybe about a decade ago. And I have been really interested in why humans have the psychological responses they do to non-human animals. So I've worked on evolutionary psychology topics, things like human emotions, disgust, sexuality, but I've also been interested in animal activism uh, in the effective altruism movement broadly. So there was a period of time in which I was uh, did a vegan podcast called The Vegan Option with Ian McDonald, who also did a vegetarian history. And then after that, I got more into the effective altruism animal uh, space because I became somewhat disillusioned with the vegan movement in the UK. Yeah, great. Thank you. And as I hinted at, your work to, I guess, popularize the idea of sentientism and work on it intersected with my own thinking, primarily when you gave the Darwin Day lecture for Humanist UK, I think two or three years ago now. And in a way, it echoed some of my own latent thinking, which was I've long thought of a naturalistic way of thinking and indeed secular humanism as a, a positive force for good, trying to ground our understanding of reality in reality itself and also to layer onto that a a sort of universal broad compassion but I've always found that frustration with humanism that the clue is in the name it's very focused on that one species and the lecture you gave there really crystallized a lot of those thoughts because you brought an unashamed naturalism to many of the human ethics topics you were talking about but also made it very clear that if you're going to be committed to evidence and reason there is no real reason why we should restrict our compassion to our own species so yeah thank you for that inspiration yeah I try I tried to bring it in gently and I'm not that super familiar with the humanist movement I don't know how much they celebrate humans over other sentient beings but it did seem to me like they would be a very sympathetic audience yeah. to the idea that we should respect other sentient beings yeah and I think they are and that, that might be something we come back to later on I think they are a sympathetic audience. And I think I asked a slightly cheeky question because instead of asking you a question, I asked the audience to put their hands up and there's maybe 1,100 people there. And I asked the audience to put their hands up as an indicator of their answer to that question of how many of them were ethical vegans and vegetarians. And I think around 40% of people put their hands up. So I think anecdotally, that's a much higher percentage than the normal population. So I think they are receptive. But at the same time, although humanists are you know, supposedly committed to evidence and reason and compassion, they are not immune to the widespread social indoctrinations of the general public when it comes to non-human animals as well. So there's a lot of, you know, explicit resistance, but also, you know, the usual cognitive dissonances within the well, human community idea, as well. I have a huge tangent. I don't think that we're socialized to be carnists or to discount the moral well-being of non-human animals. I do think that's a, the state of nature. And I think it would take quite a lot of work for us to value the lives of non-human animals in any way yeah and i think yeah we'll come back to that as we start thinking about maybe a more compassionate future and where that 
how that might play out. But it would be good to start with that. The first of those two deep questions, really, this story about what's real. And it's interesting to understand uh, my guest's personal philosophical journey, even from childhood, really. For many people, that's a story about whether they grew up in a naturalistic or an atheistic or a religious or a supernatural or a spiritual setting, family and community, and how their views shifted over time, if it has, about what's real and, I guess, the epistemological side of their philosophy. So it'd be you can go back as far as you like, really, but I'd love to hear that story. My dad's family is German and Jewish. So his mother grew up in what's now Poland, but was Germany during the war. My grandfather was a German Jew and he escaped at 15 to Denmark and then at 18 to the United States. And then he fought with the Americans in Germany and he was responsible for the occupation of the city that my grandmother had fled to. Wow. My grandmother had been living in Wrocław and Poland and had fled to a small city called Filsbyberg. And she was out after curfew. Very cute story, actually. She was like 40 kilos. She had been living on rations. And I honestly think that they just fell in love because he fed her a lot. (laughs) They really had very little in common other than that. You can Um, see the primal motivations working. Um, My grandfather was not very religious, but he was certainly very proud of being Jewish. And he had a certain Yeah, he took me to to synagogue on high holidays and he and I were incredibly close. And, you know, we just had a very unusual, almost, we were almost like two teenage, like mates, like rather than a granddaughter and a grandfather, we we hung out a lot and went out to restaurants and, and, and stuff like that. And then my mother's family is Portuguese and Catholic. And I was baptized by my mother when I was a baby in in the United States, actually, or was it? No, I think it was in Portugal, actually. And uh, my sort of Jewishy family was very upset about that, but yeah. they, they were not really practicing. And I grew up going to synagogue and to Catholic church. I went to a uh, synagogue just a few times a year with my grandfather whenever he could get me there. And then I also went to uh, Sunday school and I did first communion. And then shortly after first communion, I told my mother I didn't want to participate in church anymore, that I didn't like it. And I didn't believe it. My brother actually became an atheist, like even a couple of years before me at seven. I think it took me till nine or 10. (laughs) That's still pretty early. Or or 11. Yeah. To really think about it that way. And then I became very stridently anti-religion. And I- And even even in those days, do you remember, nine is a bit of a stretch, but do you remember why that was? Was it- you know, a fact-based thing and the evidence? Was it thinking about the ethics that came through the church as you understood that? Do you remember what it was that made you think again? Yeah, when I was in middle school, I brought in an article that was talking about the evolution of humans. I was fascinated by evolution from a very young age. My mother bought me a book by this woman called Stein called The Evolution Book. I carried it around. It would be like a teddy bear. I was obsessed with evolution. This teacher said, actually, evolution is controversial. There's, it's not a settled idea. This was back. When was this early, early nineties. Yeah. And I was really stridently against that idea. It just didn't make sense to me. Like, I think to me, the impetus for me to become a uh, sort of secular and atheist was actually, I thought that we couldn't really understand human beings without understanding the connection that humans are animals. Yeah. And it seemed yeah, just deeply mis- misguided to me that we didn't accept that fully because we thought that God made humans in some separate way from other non-human animals. And so that was, I, I was called monkey girl. I was like relentlessly teased and bullied for believing in evolution. It's a and great that was nickname. what made me so, so stridently, yeah, that's what made me so stridently anti-religious Yeah, is because I saw the people who were the most likely to bully me as generally the most religious people at my school. And in, in Cobb County, where I grew up in Georgia, they still don't, they, I don't know if they teach evolution now, but I remember in, even in high school, in the biology textbook, we skipped the evolution chapter. And then wow. a few years later, they had a sticker on the biology textbook that said, evolution isn't settled. It's a controversial, it's just a theory. It's just a theory, and, w- warning. Yeah, so they, they, slap this, this, they slap this warning sticker on the biology textbooks. So Georgia was really behind the curve. In, in many, I, mean, I grew up in, in the modern day, but in this small way, yeah. it was like I was 100 years in the history. It was very strange. So yeah, that was why I became so flippant, 
strident and yeah. anti anti religious. Although I did now that I'm older and I know more religious people, and especially when I got involved in the vegan movement and I met so many really wonderful religious people in the vegan movement, I became much less aggressively against religion. Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting story, and it's um. I think a lot of my guests have reflected that balance. Quite often there's a rejection based on seeing flawed ethics or seeing the evidence just doesn't stack up and then quite a sort of anti-start because you focus naturally on the negatives and then maybe a rebalancing as you recognize that there's so much rich, genuine compassion that flows through most of the religions. Yeah, I don't necessarily agree with the their working. The yeah. way they got that area, they, the way they came to the conclusions that they did. I don't agree that we just shouldn't abuse animals because it represents a way to be virtuous or to show God that we're virtuous. Yeah. But if it gets you at the same behavior, I can't really find fault with it. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And was it was that process, obviously you talked about the bullying at school, but was it difficult in a family context or a wider social context or with the religious people in your family? No, no, my, my parents bought me tons of books and they were very pro-evolution they, they, my, my folks never really thought about like where I should go to university. They weren't very supportive. I think when, mm. I, when I finished my PhD, my mother said, Oh, that's great. I knew that you were working on it, but I didn't know you were going to do it. There was no, I, I got a PhD. There was no PhD party. I really teased them about that because they were like asking me at one point when I was going to get married and I was like, my wedding will be as big as my PhD party. Like they, they didn't care at all. And I've gotten over that. It's fine. But yeah. but I think that they just fed me books and they didn't have strong opinions either way about yeah. these things. Yeah. So they were just very happy to indulge my intellectual curiosity. And a, a child who reads all day is incredibly easy to look after. I would be just, just <laughs> yeah. sitting by myself for hours on the floor. Studying reading. evolution. Yeah. And and that was I, I wish I, I had that reading tenacity now. It was really envious. Before yeah. you hit puberty before your, your motivations change, you're really just like trying to soak everything up as much as possible. I'd love a day back in that state. <laughs> yeah, that'd be good, wouldn't it? <laughs> and um, one other thing that happens sometimes, I think I had a similar sort of journey out of a fairly bland version of English Christianity, but a little bit later than you, my sort of mid-teenage years. And I've, again, go through various varieties of militance, militancy about my uh, you know, non-religiosity and the challenges thereof. But I've stuck with a pretty firm naturalistic worldview, whereas some people will leave a religious worldview, become quite naturalistic, and they'll describe themselves as an, as an atheist. But over time, that will shift as well. And they'll start to think not about going back into religion, but some form of uh, spirituality or mysticism or transcendence or something, again, that takes them beyond a, a naturalistic worldview. Have you ever been tempted down any of those roads yeah. at all? or? Not really, although it's it's funny. I, I put together in, in, the, in the UK before I got married uh, a Hindu of uh, 12 women, and we all went to the beach for the weekend. It was November. It wasn't really very beachy weather. And they are all, yeah. unbeknownst to me, all these women I was friends with, they started talking about spells and witchcraft and various different practices. Like a lot of them are into um, psychedelics. A lot of them are into uh, meditation and other spiritual practices. But about half of them are seriously into, they actually put together like imbol, imbol just happened, like an altar uh, to make offerings. And I think it's more of an aesthetic really than it is uh, yeah. a deep belief. I certainly think that marking the seasons with certain rituals and reverence, it definitely feels good. Mm. I don't think that they have strong opinions that these things are going to you know change their lives, but so you, I, I do spend a lot of time with people who who do those sorts of things, and I remember you're basically um, at, part of a coven. Yeah, then we call it a much. coven. We we had a at, at my Hindu. There was like a ton of tarot card reading, and I was just like, whatever. It was fun. I, I had a good time. I, I didn't really think much of it, but there were people who were really taking it quite seriously. Okay, I, I, I should actually plan like the next year of my life around this reading. I'm like, no, <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> so I do understand the the allure of those things, it it feels really nice to me. And I also have this feeling, I went to an Anglican church when I was living abroad. I was living in the UK when I was 20. And uh, my uncle had this uh, friend who was living there who was an Anglican uh, minister. Is that what it's called, the minister? Mm. And uh, I didn't take communion that day because I didn't feel like I should. 
I hadn't taken communion in many, many years, but he blessed me and I wept. I weep in churches. I weep in services. I'm incredibly moved by religious ceremony and ritual. Yeah. And it's just this division between my head and my heart that keeps me a naturalist because I'm, I think I'm exactly the kind of person who could fall deeply into religious fervor. Yeah. You'd be a prime target. Yeah. And, and I, but I find it fascinating because I think a lot of the, and again, you'll know the science of this much more deeply than I will, but I think the emotional experience I get from a sort of sense of awe and wonder and connectedness with the universe and the communal experience and the, the patterns of ritual, I can maintain those in a compl- 100% pretty hard materialistic naturalistic worldview but i'm pretty confident that the sorts of things that are going on in my mind are very similar to a religious experience or a spiritual experience that you know yeah. people who believe other stuff feel I, I think it feels the same sort of thing that's going on but i think it was sam harris's waking up where he talked a bit about how religious communities shouldn't have a monopoly on mm. a sense of deep awe and reverence yeah And in Waking Up, he talks about psychedelic manifestations of that, but also one can really enjoy natural environments. Now, I'm also two minds about natural environments. I think nature is a place of horrible suffering. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Nature is not a compassionate system. Yeah, Nature is a horrible place. Like the only reason we, we feel a beautiful sensation and a feeling of aesthetic reverence in nature for the same reasons that we, we like the taste of cheeseburgers. There's nothing more, more to it than that. It just feels m- like more virtuous. So I, I also enjoy being out in nature. I also enjoy seeing uh, beautiful works uh, of art, but I appraise all these things in the same way. I don't hold them at arm's length because it feels soulful. It feels good to my heart to let them in but I always have a certain cynical and skeptical view about my own feelings yeah, in everything. Yeah, yeah. Makes sense. And I think, that, and I, I share that view because some people think that uh, as we close out this section about the naturalistic side is that being naturalistic means a sort of narrowly scientific, cold spreadsheet based, emotionless, yeah. you know, view of the world that is devoid of meaning. But I don't see it that way at all. I think I actually find more awe and wonder and richness out of the fact that we're just, you know, patterns of information processing and, waves if you like than than a, yeah a f- fabricated supernatural perspective but i think that if you have a certain amount of faith maybe the faith is the wrong word but if i'm a naturalist and these are some of my core beliefs it's perfectly fine to get into these soulful reverent yeah. all rock states and if you constantly have to remind yourself that nature is understandable that we have a scientific view or if you have to constantly have to remind yourself that many of the states that you're experiencing are just a result of the evolution of your mind and and things could have been very different then your naturalism is somewhat fragile when it's robust you can actually really let yourself enjoy all these things i agree right And, and in a sense that's part of the point of a sentientist point of view is that we're seeing sentience itself that the nature of that experience and the experiencing of that experience as the thing of central maybe soul moral value and that's that doesn't just mean doing the maths. That means the weird soulful feelings, the emotional responses, the the wonder of what it is to experience anything at all. So yeah, I don't think you need a spreadsheet based view of, of what that feels like. It's uh, viscerally different. So. But that's, I guess, the second question we're coming on to next is what, what does matter? And some people who've held onto a religious world, you do partly because they're nervous that if they lose that supernatural standard of morality, God is perfect, God is good, what would Jesus do? Here's the list of commandments, here's the here's the Quran, here's the Talmudic readings. If they lose that frame of reference, that they'll their morality will lose any grounding whatsoever. And some people will therefore hold on to a supernatural standard, even if they question it. Others will go to a sort of total relativism where they say look morality is just constructed it's arbitrary you know it's up to groups negotiating anything goes there is no objective good and bad so it'd be interesting to know again even rolling back to your childhood days how are how is your morality grounded if it is at all how's that shifted over time and and have the boundaries of your moral consideration evolved over time as well Hmm. I do understand the anxiety and the feelings of 
yeah, uh, of confusion around taking on new moral standards mm. because it makes sense to hold a moral standards of a community. We all want to be in cooperative social groups. We all want to get along well with other people. And morality really is about cooperating, mostly with cooperating with your in-group. Mm. Now, I do think that there are other absolute standards of morality that make sense, but they're certainly not welcomed by other people. And I remember my brother's a lawyer and he's done some amazing things helping people who've been unfairly convicted in the last few years. But I remember we talking with him about veganism and he usually makes very sophisticated arguments. And he said something to the effect of my friends don't understand it. I will be not accepted into my social group. And it's not something that I'm interested in because it would lose me this sense of community that I have with the people in my life. Mm. And at the time I was super dismissive of that, but that really is what morality is about. It's, it's about being integrated into these communities and to go on your own and to say, actually, every time my mother fed me chicken when I was a kid, something that she did as a loving, caring mm. gesture, as a manifestation of her desire to see me grow it and thrive she was really doing something that I now consider really deeply wrong. And I remember these conversations I had with her when I first went vegan. And she was incredibly upset. Of course, she was incredibly upset because I was casting everything that she had done out of love in my mind at that time in this uh, light. So yeah. the sentientist morality does say that we should prioritize the suffering and reduce suffering of beings on the basis of their sentience. I do think that's a coherent moral view, but it's not going to be a view that smaller subcultures or really even the larger culture is going to be sympathetic to because it these days people are really into their pets because of lockdown. And I've seen people get so upset with, with vegans for, I fed my cat a vegan diet, or I only feed my cat meat once a week, or I feed my dog a vegan diet. And people are getting incredibly upset about that and not really understanding that they're trading off the welfare or well-being of one animal against another. And these animals probably have similar sentience. Or if you're feeding your cat fish every day, I would certainly think a, a cat and a year's worth of fish. Who knows exactly what that, what that arithmetic adds up to yeah. in terms of the sentience and the, and the moral well-being of each of those animals. And these are very difficult questions. But I, there's this concept that the rationalists really to talk about the rationalist is this kind of subculture of people who are always considering things quite carefully, everything from their lifestyle to their, the, the way they think about certain problems. And it's an idea called Chesterton's fence. Mm. And Chesterton's fence is you move to this new area, you buy a plot of land and in the middle of a field is a fence. This is Chesterton's fence. And you're like, why is that fence there? I'm just going to knock it down. And you actually don't know what the fence is for. And there's all kinds of things in a traditional worldview, things like a marriage ceremony. This is the reason that I had a wedding is because I, I considered the wedding like a Chester and Sid's fence. I'm like, I'm not sure what it does, but it seems like it's something that people do that helps them have more successful relationships. Yeah. So we're going to do this ritual and we're, because we really are strongly in favor of the end goal, which is having a successful, healthy and long lasting and stable relationship. So I understand, you know, what people are coming from, people who are lower in openness than we are, which is most people. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And what journey, uh, you know, how was your journey through that yourself? So I'm clearly you might think about humanism being a naturalistic commitment and then compassion for all humans, and then sentientism extending that and saying non-humans non-human suffering matters as well. How early did that angle come into your thinking? And again, was that a difficult transition or you talked already about in the context of family? Oh, yeah. so and I, was, and- I was super obsessed with animals when I was a kid. Mm. I spent all this time at a barn. This lady had far too many animals. She wasn't like actual animal hoarder, but I remember holding these feral kittens or they weren't feral yet, <laughs> as they were getting peritoneal injections for rabies and helping the vet when she would come and check on all the animals. And this lady had pigs and goats and she had 70 or 80 animals herself on this larger farm. 
And I just loved animals. And, and there was a girl, this punk rock girl who was in the same barn as me. And she had this, this box with all her gear and stuff in it that was covered with PETA stuff. Yeah. And I really wanted to be vegetarian. And the embarrassing thing is that when I was a kid, I ate my mother's food and then maybe seven or eight other things. I would literally gag if I smelled unfamiliar food. I was very <laughs> disgusted by food. I remember we went to a, a, like a beautiful Moroccan restaurant. I think it was like a near Disney world when I was a kid and I couldn't eat the Jasmine rice. It was so disgusting to me. So the idea of changing my eating patterns completely as a kid just seemed impossible. And yeah. so while I had this strong, strong love and care for animals, I, I just couldn't bring myself to become vegetarian. And certainly my mother and father wouldn't have ex- accepted it at that time. I would but it's have interesting even at that age that you'd actually made the connection between a compassion for a real non-human animal in front of you and what was on your plate. Because quite often those are distinct things, as, particularly as people grow up. I mean, most kids grow up feeling an intuitive compassion for non-humans, but then just don't make that connection to, to yeah. food. Whereas you you clearly recognize that, you know, there was a piece of the non-sentient being on your plate. At um, that point. My dad's sister was a veg- vegetarian. She oh, see, okay. fish and various things, but she talked to me a lot about this, much to my parents' chagrin. And I remember that <laughs> she was telling me that it was very important for me to finish my food because if the animal made this incredible sacrifice for me, the least I could do would be to finish eating it. Of course, that makes no sense. If you killed me to eat me, I wouldn't care if you, you ate care. me with my legs and both of them, like whatever. I remember making myself almost sick eating Wiener schnitzel. I was in, in Munich, is where my grandmother lives, and they, they pound the veal so it's like super flat. It goes over the edges of the plate. I know you're making a face. It is delicious. When there's a plant-based or cellular version of this, I will be eating it all the time. It's really good. But yeah, I almost made myself sick eating because I was like, oh, I just seen baby cows earlier in that trip. I had been petting them. And my dad, who's got a really macabre sense of humor, was like, there's your Wiener schnitzel right there, Diane. <laughs> so yeah. he was very happy to joke around about how I was eating these adorable animals. But it was actually not until I was 27 that I went vegan. So I was living in Austin, Texas. I was uh, going to graduate school. And over time, I had cut certain things out of my diet. I had started trying to buy humane meat. Then I had stopped eating. I was eating at restaurants where they said they had sourced these things humanely. And I really read just obsessively about animal agriculture, about de-beaking and castration, and yeah. dehorning and breeding and insemination. I was reading stuff about animal agriculture really obsessively because I wanted to find a loophole. I wanted to find some meat yeah. or eggs or something that I could eat. How can I, I justify something? Some, yeah. Yeah. Some caviar that like they scoop up the eggs from the bottom of the river rather than cutting the fish open. And, and I learned yeah. tons about this. And then I realized that there was looking really for no roadkill. Way. <laughs> exactly. I would have loved to do that. There was really no way for me to, to, to figure out a way like a, a loophole and I read Animal Liberation by Peter Singer. Yeah. And I went vegan, really hardcore vegan the next day. And that was actually, it was pretty late in my 20s that I started eating. I had like never really eaten avocados or black beans, which I basically live on now. Yeah. There were tons of food I had never eaten that I had to try because I had such limited food options. And so I really only overcame this disgust I had at pretty much all but the most familiar foods because I had no choice because I had decided to eat very differently. Yeah. As an aside, this is something I think people don't really take seriously enough. There are people who have serious heart disease or other ailments who could eat differently. We become crystallized in our eating preferences at a very young age. And this is a huge obstacle to both healthy eating and ethical eating is that everybody just wants to eat the the food foods that they were fed when they were children. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a, it's a fascinating, that's one of the reasons I find this idea of sentientism, the naturalism and the sentiocentrism interesting because there's, there seem to be quite strong parallels to me because in a sense, if you take a, just a naturalistic and attempted rational approach, my argument would be you end up an atheist, you end up with no belief in a supernatural being and in fact you end up naturalistic because you have no belief for anything that you don't have evidence for but again the social norms hold us 
really tightly and really strongly. And it feels to me like there's a parallel on the sentiocentric side in that, again, evidence-based approach uh, and a rational one would say, ultimately, while we might acknowledge the evolutionary basis for why we've come to be moral in some sense and where the rudiments of morality might have come from, if we're going to take a logical approach, it doesn't make sense to exclude any suffering being from that either. But again, the social norms are really strong. But you mentioned something before we started recording that I didn't expect because you almost echoed an argument that many people who you know consume meat and dairy products use, which is, look, it's natural. We've done it for, done it for millions of years. And that, of, of course, there is something natural about being a predator and about, about consuming other sentient beings. But at the same time, one of the stories I quite often tell in these conversations and my guests echo you also echoed which is as a child you naturally felt compassion for you know companion animals farmed animals and you wouldn't dream as a child of causing them harm because you like the taste of them so it's interesting that you've got that you know evolutionary context that does drive some need for predation and for you know ultimately harm and killing for our own pleasure and for our own sustenance but that also what seems to be an evolutionary baseline natural compassion for other agents in the environment as long as they're non-threatening how do you think those things balance out because i think i'm rambling on now but the final section of the conversation really is talking about the future and in a way that's a central frustration is that on the one hand just the force of moral argument should just be able to persuade all eight billion people to be rational and universally compassionate. And we already know that just isn't the case, right? It's much more about shifting social norms and meeting people's ethics where they are. I don't know if you can find the question um, in that random that. rambling. Two things that I'll say that are related to that. The first one is that I don't think, I think that children naturally identify with animals and they're interested yeah. in animals. But I think that children's inherent interest in animals is the same way that we're like fascinated by fire. Being fascinated by animals was the best way to learn about animals and learning about animals is the best way to exploit and kill animals. We have a fascination with animals in my view for a very cynical reason in that our oh, human ancestors had to learn to exploit and, and kill them. And um, I write about this. If you go to my, um, my blog, I have a, a chapter up there, which is about animal ethics and evolutionary psychology. And if you ask even most people in, in Western industrialized world, but especially people in more hunter-gatherer societies, uh, children torture and kill animals and play with them to death all the time. Yeah. And if you ask people as a child, did you ever cause an animal suffering for your own merriment and amusement? The majority of men say yes. It's almost half of women um, say yes to the same thing. And there was a time that I was trying to teach a baby bird to fly when I was a kid, there was all these swallows that were living in the barn um, ceiling. And one of them fell down and was almost fledged. She had feathers and stuff already. So I was like throwing her little ways and throwing her little ways and trying to get her to learn how to fly. But I was being rough on her and she crawled away from me to try to get away. And I accidentally killed her. She yeah. fell under some whatever. And I remember feeling pretty bad at that time, but not incredibly shocked. And so what I think is going on in the current day is that children have these, these pets, their parents teach them not to torture cats and dogs to death generally. But when you see children playing with wild animals, it usually doesn't go very well for those, for those wild animals. Yeah. And so there's this, been this decoupling where children have this affinity for animals, but they're also not playing with real animals. Yeah. And in the chapter, I had this quote from Pinker, which is from an anthropologist, which is about how she would, she had these things to exchange with these indigenous people that she was studying, trinkets, beads, clothes for their participation. And she would sometimes pay them with these things to take an animal away from them that they were like messing with. And then the next day they would have recaught that same animal again. The second thing I'm going to say that's controversial in like a more vegan community is I think that some people cannot thrive on a vegan diet. Mm. And I think that this is a, a fringe idea but we've only been living on plants or on the, the, the process of agriculture, the products of agriculture for some period of time. So honestly, the potatoes and corn and all of the, the plant foods that we eat because of domestication, they're much more nutritious than they used to be. So I think that's a, you know, a bad argument to say, oh, our ancestors didn't eat plants. They didn't eat plants because the wild undomesticated versions of those plants would have never had enough calories for anyone yeah. uh, to live on. I do think that humans evolved 
eating meat. And I do think that there are people who are not healthy on a vegan diet. And that's a very easy argument for many people to make who just want to eat meat all the time. And I know many people who are involved in the paleo movement who think it's important that they eat meat at every meal because that's the most natural ancestral kind of way to eat. The argument that I make with such people is why don't you just eat meat once a week? If you think that it's necessary for health to eat meat, then eat it as little as you can Yeah. while, uh, or try and eat as I make the argument in practical veganism that, that, that you'll link in the, in the show notes, eat beef once a week. That's fine. If that, if you really think that you need to. So I agree that it's difficult to merge together a sentientist worldview, a naturalistic worldview, a science-based worldview. And I don't know how much time you spent in the vegan movement in the UK, but there's a lot of people who are chasing veganism in that movement because they have serious health problems Mm. or because of unusual spiritual beliefs and not because of any science-based worldview. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things I'm trying to do with my recasting of sentientism is just keep it as that very simple baseline. So it just says naturalism and it just says sentiocentrism. So it doesn't tell you how to trade off competing interests. It doesn't say just as human even a humanist would say sometimes harming a human or even killing a human could be the morally right thing to do. That may well be the case under a sentientist worldview as well. So it's not, it doesn't, it, it doesn't tell you the moral answer. It just says we should have serious moral consideration for all sentient beings. But then there's many different schools of thought about how to play those things out. And um, there's often a lot of nuance that's lost in these conversations and a lot of performative statements made. And I think ultimately the the humanist, atheist, free thinking, rationalist movements could benefit a great deal by being less anthropocentric and broadening their circle of compassion. But also the animal advocacy and vegan movements could gain a great deal by being more naturalistic, more evidence-based, you know, more rational in pursuing their broader compassion. So that's that's partly what I'm hoping will happen with, with uh, normalising this idea of sentientism. But I, I guess that, that brings us quite neatly onto the final section of the conversation, which is... I think we're in this, I I was going to say unusual, but it's also remarkably normal situation where I think you and I, many of my guests share a sort of naturalistic worldview and we share a sentiocentric perspective that means all suffering is morally salient. We don't necessarily know what to do about it, but suffering in itself is a bad thing. And those two things to me feel almost tautologically true. What better way is there of understanding reality than engaging with it honestly and almost by definition, morality is about cooperation and concern for the other, which implies, you know, the suffering of the other is bad, you know, regardless of their characteristic or their caste or their species or their gender or whatever else. But most people on the planet disagree with this because if you, you know, survey 8 billion people, most of them have a range of views that they don't even attempt to base on evidence and reason that are explicitly supernatural and some of which are, are not harmful, some of which are, and many of them have a very different scope of moral concern. Many people will have partial concern for some types of sentient being, you know, companion animals, charismatic wildlife, but have practically zero concern for farmed animals or the non-charismatic wildlife. But as we know, we have problems within the human species as well about partial or conditional granting of consideration based on caste, sex, gender, sexuality, all of those other considerations as well. So in that weird situation where I think you and I probably will disagree over many things, but we can agree on that sort of fundamental baseline, at least as a starting point, but nearly everyone else disagrees. How do you think the future looks as we try and make the world and the universe a better place? And I I ask people to try and take an optimistic cast sometimes by saying, look, imagine we could magically persuade most of the 8 billion people to adopt that more broadly compassionate naturalistic view, what would that world look like? Whether you want to go sci-fi or long-term or or think about more intermediate projects. I'll just start by saying that the COVID pandemic, I I had really high hopes for a sort of a sci-fi future, like uploading and, 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 and I just really reduced my impression of the best case scenarios of humanity since the the pandemic because of how it was mishandled by almost every government yeah. including those that have been you know e- yeah even the kind of trade-offs that people have made so i have lower credence 
and these kinds of future views that, than I used to. But it does seem that we have cellular agriculture that's improving. Yeah. In Israel, there's a restaurant that actually serves food for free. I think it's just called chicken. <laughs> <laughs> and it serves cellular agriculture chicken, clean meat chicken. And they have, you know, they're offering it for free because they want really detailed feedback from the customers. In Singapore now, they're offering clean meat of various kinds. And so I've never been, when I was early in my vegan journey, when I was in my late twenties, I was really fascinated by Gary Francione and the abolitionist movement. But he was always saying, we haven't really tried hard enough to get people to go vegan. We haven't really doubled down enough. And as I saw the needle of what percentage of the population is vegan, like never moving up, no matter how much advocacy people heard. And when I heard that most people who say they're vegan and vegetarian are really not vegan or vegetarian, I started becoming much more interested in how we were going to be able to make meat that doesn't come from animals. And there's still a long journey ahead, but that's mm. the thing that makes me most hopeful is that I do think that we're going to be able to grow animal cells and feed the world with meat that's produced in this way so long as there's no ideas, superstitious and otherwise, that you can only really be healthy if you kill an animal yeah. and eat their meat. Or so long as there's no association with clean meat and any bad outcome. So long as those kinds of things can be, this is what we see with genetically modified foods yeah. is that unfortunately they became associated with all these vague concerns and then it made people very wary of them. And I, I think that they could have accomplished a lot more good. And I hope the same fate doesn't befall clean meat. I, I did work on and uh, a project with the, the Sentience Institute that was interested in what parallels is there between the clean meat movement and, and how we're going to have clean meat and yeah. genetically modified organisms and the backlash against those things. So that's what I think is really important. I don't really know if human beings, the, the way we are now, so there's this thing called the Flynn effect, which is the idea that every generation humans are getting smarter. And there's some controversy yeah. about whether or not humans are still getting smarter. Uh, and this is a somewhat controversial idea, but I do think that you have to have a certain level of intelligence to be able to think outside of your moral circle of concern. You have to have a certain level of intelligence to overcome your intuitions about what's moral. It's very hard to overcome those things without it. And I am a big proponent of cognitive enhancement for future humans. I would love in my lineage to be the dumbest person <laughs> <laughs> right? I would love that. Maybe. My kids already outsmart me, but they could, they could do, yeah, do so by another leap. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'd love that. But people are very averse to this idea of cognitive enhancement. Yeah. They have whatever, I'm not going to talk about eugenics concerns because people just slap the E word onto anything that has to do with transhumanism or improving um, the human species. But overall, uh, I do think that would be necessary. And people like Julian Savalescu and Brian Earp have talked about things like moral enhancement. Are we going to be able to, in the future, make human moral motivations better? Are we going to be able to overcome our moral intuitions? And that, of course, takes for granted that our moral worldview is correct and that the moral intuitions that we have, in my view, and, and in the views of many other people, they evolve to solve certain problems, but they have no basis in objective truth. Yeah. They have no basis in, in, in an absolute moral view. So that's those are my kind of hopes uh, for the future. And we'll see how far along we get. There's so much resistance to the ideas still among you know the, the mainstream view of the public. And we will see, you know, if people become smarter. And I really hope that we're going to be raising fewer animals for food. We're going to be torturing fewer animals in factory farms and in, in animal agriculture in the future because clean meat will be cheaper, tastier, and healthier than anything that we have on offer off the hoof, as they say. Yeah, yeah, I agree. That's an inspiring vision. And and it does sometimes feel that with these two sides of the, the cognitive and the moral, there's... It, 
it can sometimes feel there's a negative correlation there and that the people who are more naturally compassionate sometimes fall victim to you know skepticism about gmos or poor quality evidence or supernatural or mystical ways of thinking that then perverts their genuine rich compassion and people who are maybe cognitively gifted and rationally committed sometimes struggle a little bit with the extension of compassion. I don't know if that goes slightly against what you were suggesting, that you need a certain yeah. level of cognitive ability to, to be more compassionate, but sometimes it feels... You know, I certainly know, yeah. I know people who are like naturally very compassionate and it's been twisted because it, they're very prone to all... You know, this is actually not that uncommon. People in a staff meeting I had when I was still at university, like a half an hour long conversation about the poor trees, how there were yeah. people were using too much paper. And, and I was like... Trees are not sentient. (laughs) They grow trees for this purpose. We're not wasting trees or taking away little woodland Disney creatures at homes by printing up things on paper one-sided. It's really, it's actually, you're going to be doing more harm to the world eating lunch today than I would printing a hundred thousand pieces of paper. But anyway, it seems incredibly, (laughs) incredibly, people are very sensitive about those things. And I do think that people who have a lot of compassion they often become completely embroiled in cat rescuing, dog rescuing, those kinds of concerns, yeah. which in many ways, it's a beautiful thing. But the the whole structure that we have around society is moral signaling towards animals is mostly towards towards cats and dogs. If you If you care more about chickens than your cat and you feed them whatever, you would feed them whatever food that's fortified with carnine instead of a a chicken, people will call you a monster. People will call you a moral monster. So that's one idea. But there's also, of course, the other thing where there's like very smart people who are not really tapped into their sense of compassion. Yeah. And they are, they have the opposite problem. Like it's very easy for them to overcome these evolved sympathies especially when it comes to things like pets that are really bred to look a lot like babies like that's that's why women often become so obsessed with cats and dogs it makes that they they can overcome those things very easily but they're not really motivated to think about where should my compassion go how should i think about things morally their concerns are otherwise and sentience and other sentient beings are not really foremost on their list of concerns so i do think that yeah both kinds of personalities have their problems yeah it's tricky well it's been a fascinating conversation and hopefully we've set out some vision sort of vision of a rich generous compassion but also an unashamed naturalism about how we um, get to that more compassionate world but yeah it's been great to talk to you great to talk um, to you What's the best way of people following you, finding out more about your work? You talked about your practical vegan post, your most recent post, which um, I'll include I usually some post to. stuff on Twitter. So yeah. um, I'm at Sentientist on Twitter. I also have a website and I have a blog called Dianaverse. My website has got all my links and stuff. I did take a long break from Twitter over the near civil war that we had here in the United yeah. States. <laughs> Didn't really want to engage with any of that. <laughs> Just wanted to hunker down. But I, I am generally updating what's going on with me on there. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. At Sentientist. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. At Sentientist over there, at Sentientism over here. So it's a good couple of accounts to follow, but I'll include all of those links in the notes. So um, thank you again for the conversation. It's brilliant to have your help normalizing rationality and compassion. And uh, again, thanks for the inspiration for... Uh, this amateurish project I've been working on. Yeah. Yeah. Cheers. Thanks a lot, Diana. Take care.